on KTN Prime. The truth behind Westgate or raise it. House committee give its verdict at last. I have deferred the date of commencement of the act from 10th of January 2014 to the 31st of May 2014. Space to breathe. Why the government has deferred new NSSF rates. Caught on camera, CCTV footage unmasks Nairobi's daylight robbers. For the people within the road corridor, that they have to move. And they have already been given notices. Paving way for a super highway and a field day for vandals. This is KTN Prime with Yvonne Okwara and Wilson Buru. It is the 21st day of January 2014 and you're tuned in to the most comprehensive bulletin in the country. This is KTN Prime. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Let's start off in Parliament. Two parliamentary committees that have been tasked with the investigation of the Westgate Mall attack now say all the terrorists involved in the terror attack died in the mall and did not escape as widely speculated. And as KTN's Dennis Onsarigo reports, the team also insists the body parts of the terrorists were recovered from the scene. Here's that story. The Joint Committee on National Security and Defense Findings made are those of America's Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI. The Asman Kamama-led committee says none of the four attackers involved in the siege managed to escape. The committee says all the four attackers were killed and four guns recovered. The reports have named terror suspects as these four. The men seen on CCTV footage Kenyan so soon after the attack, Mohamed Abdi Noor of Somali nationality, Mohamed Hassan Dulo, an origin citizen of Somali origin, Yaya Osman Hamid, a Somali national of Arab descent, and Hamid Hassan Abakar of Somali nationality. The joint committee insists that their body parts and their rifles were recovered from the scene, though no proof has ever been shown to the Kenyan public. <laughs> The Joint Committee makes startling revelation that indeed the Kenya Defense Forces slowed down the security operation inside the mall. According to the committee, a squad from the GSU Rec Company was forced to back down after the arrival of the KDF. The National Security and Defense Committee says the highly specialized squad had cornered the attackers by the time the Kenyan Defense Forces were arriving at the scene. The report appears to side with this man, the Director General of the National Intelligence Service, Michael Gish the team say the security agencies were informed about the attacks at major shopping malls in the city. The report says the information was made available to relevant security officers in Nairobi County on the first weeks of August and September 2013. That was approximately two and a half weeks before the attackers came calling. The committee that had earlier prematurely cleared the KDF of looting allegations confirms in the report that indeed looting took place. The parliamentary teams however distances security forces from the partial collapse and destruction of the building. The parliamentary committee blames a firefight between the terrorists and security forces for the destruction. The Department of Immigration has been inducted in what the Joint Parliamentary Team says is a nationwide complete collapse of its systems. The media has not been spared either. The Parliamentary Teams want media content from scenes of disasters regulated. Six months later, the government is yet to set up a commission of inquiry into the country's worst terrorist attack in the recent past. Denson Sarigo, Kitchen Prime. Well, that that's is, forms yes. a 
<laughs> My apologies for that. That forms the basis of our big question tonight. And we are asking, do you believe the Joint Parliamentary Committee is finding that all the four terrorists were killed at Westgate? Do you believe the Joint Parliamentary Committee's findings uh, that all the four terrorists were, ki were killed at Westgate? Participate in our bulletin tonight. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this issue. Please do send us a text. Start with a yes or no, followed by a brief comment to our text number, which is 22155. You can also get us on Twitter at KTN Kenya, at Yvonne Okwara and at Wilson underscore Mburu. We will continue to sample your views throughout this live newscast, so keep them coming. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's move now to some serious money matters. And the National Social Security Fund has shelved its plans to roll out the increased contributions by workers that were to take effect from the end of this month. So if you've been paying 200 shillings a month to NSSF, like most other workers, you will continue to do so until the end of May. As Samogina reports, Labour Cabinet Secretary Kazungu Kambi rescinded the decision soon after a meeting with the Federation of Kenya Employers. The giant social security provider NSSF has given Kenyan workers four more months to enjoy the gratification of their salaries, postponing the new rates that would have seen a worker remit 12% of their salaries to the fund. Kenyans will continue with the 200 shillings monthly contribution for now. Today, I have deferred the date of commencement of the act from 10th of January 2014 to the 31st of May 2014. Many Kenyans were already preparing to tighten their belts even further this month end, as the enforcement of the new rules will have been reflected in the January pay slips. But in postponing the enforcement debt, the Labour Cabinet Secretary admitted to lack of logistical and structural infrastructure to handle the bulk payment. The decision to shelve the rollout plan coming after employers' federation's intervention. By the end of the day, it's better that we defy it and uh, we start as one, uh, uh, one, one family rather than uh, the employer pulling, the government is pulling, uh, the employees are pulling. We see the window period provided as a time that we'll spend doing a lot of education, answering questions and helping employers understand, first of all, the structure of contributions and also putting in place the systems to remit the contributions as is required. In effecting the increment from a flat rate of 200 shillings monthly to 6% of the gross salary, NSSF is poised to transform from a provident to a pension scheme to benefit retirees. But with a reputation of scandals dogging the fund, the latest being the Tasia housing project, NSSF capability to handle the enhanced pensioners' kitty is in question. We have a new team uh, uh, at NSSF and uh, they are they're doing a good job. And let me tell you this again, that uh, I'll never, never allow for any penny to be misused. I'll never allow that. And I know the guilt are, are, are afraid and they are going to be punished according to the law. In a simplified version, the new rules would have seen those earning less than 6,000 shillings contributing 360 shillings per month to NSSF this month end. Those earning up to 18,000 shillings were to pay a maximum of 720 shillings, while those earning above 18,000 shillings were to be deducted 1,080 for NSSF. Employer would match this amount shilling for shilling to meet the new regulations. Samogina Katian. Now, Christian has acquired CCTV footage that reveals a gang of robbers who are said to be terrorizing shoppers in Nairobi's central business district. This latest video shows a daring daylight robbery that happened just over a week ago at Kingswear Shop along Tom Boyer Street. And as KTN's Betty Charlo reports, the shop's owner are asking why it is taking so long to bring the robbers to book, even with the damning video evidence. It is exactly 4 minutes to 3 p.m. Business continues as usual at the Kingswear Limited along Tom Boyer Street. But at exactly 2.57 p.m., this man enters the shop acting as a curious customer. 
A few seconds later, another man joins him at the counter. Notably, these two behave as if they do not know each other. About a minute later, two other men walk into the shop and immediately order all shoppers to lie down on the floor. At this point, the first two men rush to the counter and begin emptying the till. As these events unfold, another accomplice takes charge at the door, ensuring that no passerby detects anything unusual. However, as this unsuspecting customer approaches the shop, oblivious of the events taking place, he is forced to enter the shop and is immediately ordered to hand over his valuables. At this point, customers who had been ordered to lie down are also forced to surrender their valuables, including money and phones. A different CCTV camera shows the men at the counter stacking money into a black polythene bag as the customers were cornered at the store. In just five minutes, the robbers had terrorized the customers, made away with money and other valuable items. They then left the shop and disappeared into the streets. The shop owners say they reported the incident to the central police station, but the police have not yet taken any action. Cases of similar thefts are becoming common in the CBD, with business owners lamenting that efforts to beef up security using CCTV cameras are not deterring gangs, as police have not been effective in arresting suspects. The Nairobi governor has promised before that soon the entire CBD will be under the watch of Big Brother. The question is whether the security arms will take the next step and use the CCTV recording to track and bring criminals to book. Betty Kialo, KTN. A notice in the newspapers late last year served to notify workers and business owners along Nairobi's Outer Ring Road that they were up for eviction as the Kenya Urban Roads Authority sought to expand the road. The expansion project is expected to take three years, easing traffic along the road in a mega project almost similar to the thicker superhighway. But it comes at a cost. A section of business premises along the road will have to be brought down. And the business community is having sleepless nights over this project. The traders do a brisk business. Demand for furniture is high, even in January. But the traders' days here are numbered. The face of Outer Ring Road is about to change. Late in 2013, the Kenya Urban Roads Authority secured funding from the World Bank and the African Development Bank to expand the 13-kilometer stretch of road known as the Outer Ring Road in Nairobi. It has become a road that is within the built-up areas and it needs to be expanded so that the travel time between in that area can be improved. The plan is ambitious to turn the stretch of road which starts at Taj Mall in Embakasi and runs up to the GSU headquarters into a dual carriageway. The new road will have dedicated bus lanes, service roads on each side, footpaths and a cycle lane. There will be 10 pedestrian footbridges. Access roads into Tena, Donholm, Southlands, Jacaranda, Kayole and Umoja estates will have a six-lane underpass, while the Jogo Road roundabout will be replaced with a four-leaf clover interchange. This is expected to ease the congestion on the roads in the fashion of thicker superhighway, but it comes at a cost. Once complete, the new and improved outer ring road is expected to ease congestion. However, in order to benefit, a section of business owners along the road will have to relinquish their positions. Traders along the road are a worried lot. The Urban Roads Authority has already begun to issue notices asking them to prepare to move. It is a move that is causing anxiety and speculation is rife as to which buildings may be brought down as construction begins. Our daily breads, uh, we got it here and uh, it affects so many people. A study found that there were 445 small business premises along the road. It also emerges that construction of the junctions may require the government to compulsorily acquire the land around the Donholm roundabout, eliciting fears that businessmen will suffer great losses. Kura, however, counters that it has put aside almost 800 million shillings for compensation to persons who can prove the legitimacy of their claim. 
supermarket, as far as now we know, we don't have anybody within the road reserve as a supermarket. Yeah, but you know the issue of petrol stations because they're going to be affected. The bottom line now that despite any misgivings, come June, work will begin on the new and improved outer ring road. But whether the road will prove a blessing or a curse is anyone's guess. Wilkesanyabwa, KTN. Chaos and protests rocked several parts of the country today as businessmen and civilians alike protested against new levies charged by respective county governments. In Mombasa, pol police lobbed tear gas and wielded batons in running battles with hawkers who are opposed to the new levies as well as plans to relocate them from the city centre. In Muranga and Limuru, businesses were closed down while in Machakos, Governor Dr. Alfred Mutua found his newly signed Finance Act challenged in court. Ferdinand Mundi reports. Confusion and panic. Several streets in Mombasa were rendered impassable when anti riot police took on protesting hawkers intent on interrupting daily business. For the second day running, the hawkers roundly opposed plans to relocate them from their usual open air slots in the city center. They barricaded major roads and gave police a torrid time restoring order. Some shop owners were not a happy lot with either side. I'm so disappointed with the way the police are dealing with the riots. They are supposed to protect us, the business people, in our shops. Instead, they are beating us inside our shops. In fact, they've injured my neighbor here. Do they want to bring Mombasa to a standstill just because a few hooligans are rioting on the streets? It's very unfair. Some innocent pedestrians and shoppers were unlucky to be caught in the melee and took home some painful stories of the baton. Hawkers are complaining that they have been ordered out of the CBD without being told where else to go. But the county government has defended the move. There are issues of security uh, that uh, are related to the presence of hawkers and unlicensed uh, traders within the, the city. So the county government uh, will no longer tolerate hawking uh, in the main streets of Mombasa, especially on the, on, in the central business district. In Uranga, hundreds of residents also took to the streets, demonstrating against new levies imposed by the county government. The residents claimed the levies would cripple small businesses and called for a review. Wanainzi wanalamika kwa sababu biashara zenyewe, hakuna maendeleo na hakuna jambo lote ambao limefanyo na county government. La kuwafanya ya kwamba waongezewe hizi licenses ama koti ambazo zimiongezewa na sirikali ya county. They said the government should have held discussions with them before the levies were imposed, while others expressed frustrations with the devolved system of government. In Limuru, businessmen chose the Cold War in their protest against increased levies. Most shops were closed, with few options to even get a matchbox. Stakeholders held a meeting at Kiradimo Grounds in Limuru, where they resolved not to pay any levies until the county government of Kiambu held consultations with them. At the same time, Kiambu MCS met at her hotel and condemned certain legislators who they accused of inciting for the demos. And in Machakos County, a petition challenging new rates which was set by the county government began today before High Court Judge Lilian Otiende. Business people in the county are up in arms against what they feel are very high rates imposed by Governor Dr. Alfred Mutua's administration. Hawa ni watu ambaha wapati pesa nyingi, lakini ushuru ambao metolewa katika hii Finance Act ambayo ilitolewa na County Council, uko juu kabisa. We've got quite a bulky uh, documentation demonstrating how public participation was achieved. There was drama as supporters of Dr. Mutua and protesting people engaged in a heated verbal exchange over the governor's policies. Some feel aggrieved by allegations that the governor has reportedly dished out land for free to rich investors while imposing more levies on the poor. Kitui Chamber of Commerce Chairman Simon Kideka urged business people not to pay trading licenses until the case is determined. It will be heard on the 10th of February.
county administrations countrywide are effecting changes they feel will make them run their governments better. However, some of these decisions, especially those involved in the raising of levies, have been roundly condemned or, as was the case today, violently so, and is now threatening to sow the first seeds of discontent in the devolved system of government. Ferdinand Mundi, KTN, Mombasa. Now, even as you have your dinner tonight, the situation is different for thousands of families who are facing drought in three counties within the North Rift. The Kenya Red Cross Society has warned of the drought that is in its second stage in Baringo, West Pokot, and Turkana counties, with famine already confirmed in Kalapata, Lochwa, Kaptir, and Nakwamoru areas. KTN's Masikandia reports. The dry Turkana region has shown its ugly side. Again, the annual drought season has hit the area hard. The scorching sun and clear clouds, an indication to the residents here and a reminder of tough times ahead, lives hanging on the line. It is true. There is drought is catching up very fast with our people. And uh, the last two days ago, oh no, the last one week ago, we had a, a we had a contingency planning meeting. The most affected areas being Kalapata, Lochwa, Kaptir, Lokichar, Lorogon, and Nakwamoru. Three days ago, two elderly women were caught feasting on dog's meat in Kakuma, with the local administration saying initial reports showed that women aged between 60 and 70 admitted they ate dogs due to hunger pangs. They will still eat more because an angry person has no choice, yeah, when you have nothing to eat. It is evident there is famine at that particular place. Those who are, when they are hit by insecurity, on the other side they are, they are hit by famine. The Kenya Red Cross Society says the drought is on its second stage, the let alert stage, and they are currently doing a detailed assessment in Turkana County, adding that action needs to be taken to avoid loss of lives. We hope that uh, the report will be able to guide every stakeholder so that we don't have a repeat of what happened in 2011 when we lost so many, so many lives. Baringo and West Pokot counties are also at risk. The Food and Agriculture Organization FAO in November last year warned of a looming food shortage by April this year, a shortage that has come earlier than anticipated. It's still not out of hand. Actions can be taken. Water pumping is said to start this week in Napu Bohol, about six kilometers from Lodwa town. Locals will, however, not access their precious commodity until March. The water source at Lotikipi Plains is also sealed up to date since its discovery last year. To avoid a repeat of what the country witnessed in 2011, the Kenya Red Cross is now calling upon the government and other relevant stakeholders to act upon the drought situation in Baringo and Turkana counties as soon as now. Masi Kandie KTN, Eldoret, Wasingishu County. Once again, Kenyans are being warned of looming drought in Turkana. But the question on most minds is, what happened to the 1 billion shillings collected in 2011 to cushion the same Turkana residents from drought in both the short and long term? Now, it turns out that the answer to that question is more complicated than we might think. KTN's Catherine Omando has more on this. <laughs> Images that have for decades been synonymous with Turkana. In June 2011, through the Kenyans for Kenya initiative, started by the Kenya Red Cross Society and Corporate Kenya, most thought that these images would henceforth be relegated to the annals of history, never to be seen again. But they did not, and now yet again Kenya faces looming drought. What we raised was about a billion Kenya shillings, of which seven uh, 100 was in, million was in cash and which uh, 300 million was in kind. Of the 700 million, 50% uh, of that was used for food at the time to buy food to go and, and give Unimix and maize and all the uh, food that we could give to Kenyans then. So half of that is 350 million. By his calculation, that amount was nowhere near enough to end drought in Turkana, let alone other areas. 
we were able to, under Kenya for Kenya program, show three pilot projects. Mm -hmm. Two were agriculture based, the other one was largely water. We did one in Waldai in Moyale. We have 200 acres under cultivation for the community there in the middle of an arid, semi-arid part who are pastoralists who had lost uh, their animals and now are growing their own food and they're eating and selling the surplus. But that's a drop in the ocean of that community. The caveat of the program was to give the government a head start in ending drought, not just in Turkana but other parts of the country as well. But the government seems to have failed to pick up the baton from the Kenya Red Cross Society and Corporate Kenya. Dr. Kamudayo Chieng, a conflict analyst, explains that the seeming laxity by the government to pick up the Kenyans for Kenya initiative in Turkana is because northern Kenya has always been seen as someone else's problem. There are negligence on the part of the colonial government plus successive governments. You see the uh, colonial government uh, in its own divide and rule men, uh, approach eh, created two centers of power. One center of power was an economic power. So it could unleash economic uh, strangulation on the other center. The other center was usually a militarized power. This marginalization has left Turkana at the mercy of donor organizations, creating a dependency culture that has been hard to remove. The flooding in of NGOs makes it easier for the government, so the government does not think about that area because it knows there will always be aid from uh, another source. However, the problem also with NGOs is that they would like also to sustain themselves and make themselves relevant. When it comes to aid agencies, I think the government must take the, 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 the full control in a very organized, professional manner and see who adds value and who doesn't add value. The solution is we just need to invest in Turkana. And I think uh, very soon, Turkana will transform itself. So as the Kenya Red Cross Society predicts looming drought, all eyes are on the government, both county and national, to finally take the baton and find a lasting solution to drought, famine, poverty, conflict and ignorance that plagues northern Kenya. Catherine Omwanto, KTN.